liebe Motorsportfreunde. Hier für eine weitere Folge 1000 Grand Prix, die besten 100 Geschichten der Formel 1 Historie. Heute treffen wir einen Zeitzeugen, Eddie Jordan, einer der Paradiesvögel der Formel 1. Er hatte in seiner Zeit zwischen 1991 und 2005 alle deutschen Fahrer in seinem Team. Wir wollen über diese Zeit sprechen. Hello Eddie, we meet you at the famous place, Sir Martin Switzerland, this wonderful mountain in the back. And we are happy to invite you to our program. Well, as you can see, uh, it's the end of another enthralling Formula One season. And uh, it's chill time now for the next couple of weeks. And uh, I'm skiing with a couple of friends of mine and no better place to come to uh, Les Anges, which is uh, World Chalet number one of the year. And of course, in the backdrop, we have the Matterhorn. It just is just it's idyllic. This is something that's been going on for 25, 30 years, skiing with my friends at the end of the season. And uh, I look forward to it. Even when times are bad in the mid-season, I think about the good times at the end of the season. So we're going to have a chat, are we, Michael? Okay, that's what we do. So we go inside. Thank you. Okay, Eddie. We met last weekend at Abu Dhabi. And there's one team driving, which is called Force India. I think it's the successor of what you build up. Do you still think, uh, feel it's your baby? Um, some ways, no. Some ways, yes. I look into the factory and I see so many people that were there 18, 20 years ago. Uh, I'm here skiing with Andy, who was a guy I employed in uh, 1987. And he is now sporting director there. So, yes, there's a lot of history. But, you know, the great thing that I enjoyed um, and still enjoy is the people that I worked with very seldom move away. And so, therefore, when I look into Force India, Yes, of course, I feel a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit of that is mm. still me. You were in Formula 3000 and then you made a step. At the time, did you think that's a bloody big toy I'm going to afford now? You know, I have, I have to say, because alongside 3000, um, I had Formula 3. And um, I had a slight dichotomy. By that, I mean... Um, I had won a lot of Formula 3 championships, I had won a lot of three Formula 3 races, both in England and in Europe, um, but particularly Formula 3000, uh, people like Jean Alessi, Johnny Herbert, uh, Martin Donnelly, people uh, who were outstanding drivers. And I got to a stage where I was managing a lot of those drivers, particularly those drivers that I sent to Japan, and I thought, I'm never going to be happy. And my wife had the same feeling even though she was never involved in the business, she said, you're never going to be happy unless you go to Formula One and at least try what it's like. And um, it was a stupid idea. And the reason was stupid because I had made some money. I'd come from Ireland where there was no money and I'd made some money with driver changes and, and managing young drivers and winning championships. And then to put it all at risk mm -hmm. for a Formula One dream was, in my opinion now, um, very crazy and very mad. And would I do it again? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I didn't care about the risk. I didn't care about anything. I only cared about Formula One. I wanted to beat them. I wanted the, the people to believe that I was going to create a Formula One team that could win championships. Mm -hmm. Mercedes won this championship with 1,600 people altogether. Tell us how many people worked for you, you in the year 91. How big was your budget? Well, oh. First of all, uh, the budget is very clear. I, I started with five million, which I had myself, which was a lot. It was everything that I'd ever saved and put together and all of the success that we'd had. I mean, it was a very huge amount of money at that time in 91 or 90. And um, so um, my sponsorship between uh, Pepsi-Cola was 7-Up with Ireland, the country. Uh, with uh, Fuji and the drivers and Malbu with Bertram Gasho and uh, Andrea de Cesaris. I probably had another 12, 14, so what's that, 20, and I was, at the end, I was down 5 million. So mm. I started with 5 million, I lost that 5 million, and I'm now in the hole for 5 million. So, five, so 27 million was probably the budget, mm -hmm. and there was probably the same number of people, maybe mm -hmm. 27, 26. It was the extension of the Formula One. Uh, Formula 3000. The Formula 3000. Yeah. But what people may not realize in the first year, because I didn't 
believe or I wasn't 1000% sure I could make this work. I also had the Formula 3000 team. So one weekend we were doing the Formula 3000. So Gary Anderson and, and, and every, everybody else and uh, Andrew Green mm -hmm. uh, were engineers on cars in Formula 3. And then the next week we were doing a Formula 1 race. So it was completely crazy. So I don't think there's a team out there that could ever contemplate doing such a thing. But, you know, when you want to do something so badly, when you need to achieve, when you need to see or find some success or to follow a dream, mm. then the obstacles, they're not there. You don't see them, you don't feel them, and you don't even consider them. Yeah. You had only three designers at the time. You're aware that this Jordan 191 was one of the best-looking Formula One cars ever? Well, Many people I, say that. I, I, I don't want to. There were some great cars. The fan car was good. And I think, uh, you know, the Brabham BT44. Mm. Personally, I'm biased. But I think the Jordan 191 was the nicest looking car. Mm. But I didn't design it. And Gary designed it with Mark Smith. And, of course, the designer who's still there in Force mm. India, Andy Green. And um, they get the credit. You know, I was only the guy who was helping to pay the bills and to making sure, sure, uh, the design meetings, I was there mm. and I would accept this or I wouldn't accept that and this is what I like and I don't like that. And, of course, I had some input, but not in terms of the actual design. Um, it was presented to me and it was a question of yes or no. Mm. So, um, was I completely outside the loop? No. Was I involved in the design side? No. But... The people that I had around me created that car. Yeah. One part of, let's say, the good look of the car was the color scheme as well. The green was a reference to Ireland or a request well, of a sponsor? Oh, well, originally it was to be yellow because having won the championship with Jean Alessi mm -hmm. uh, with Camel, uh, I thought Camel had inferred to me that they would sponsor me into Formula One. So I automatically thought that the car was going to be yellow. Um, uh, of course, uh, Flavio at the time and Benetton, um, they had Ford and they saw what I was doing. So they went to Camel and they got Camel. So it left me with no sponsor. Um, but it is a very strange story. But I remember at that Christmas in 1990, speaking to a global conference uh, of the sales and the marketing people of Pepsi-Cola. And um, during our conference, of course, at that time, they didn't pay me, but I, I was speaking to all the delegates. And during that time, um, I explained to them why and the value and the opportunities that avail in, in Formula One. And they said to me, interesting story, they said, look, we want to thank you, but you were always aware we're not going to be sponsoring you, but we wish Eddie Jordan the very best and they all clapped. And he said, as we know, guys, um, we will be sp sponsoring Michael Jackson on his world tour. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to believe this. Camel stopped. I had no sponsor. Michael Jackson put too much uh, lacquer in his hair. <laughs> his hair went on fire, cancelled the tour. <laughs> Pepsi-Cola, 7-Up, came to me, and that's how the car is green. Because I wanted 7-Up, not, not Pepsi-Cola. Okay. And then I went to Ireland, and I explained to Ireland... You know, you're a great young country um, and you have everything in Silicon Valley uh, in America and all of these big corporates and these high-tech businesses are looking for an opportunity of a country inside Europe that can use the advantages of the EU and various other things. Um, but Ireland has no experience of technology. All they ever did was milk cows, agriculture and make beef. Uh, so I think you need to find a way to, and I said the perfect example for you in the Irish government was to have Jordan as part of their, if you like, incentive to look at, this is the new Ireland, mm -hmm. this is the new idea, mm -hmm. Jordan is high technology, Formula One is high technology. And as a result of that, I convinced then the Minister of Sport to come along with me and put Ireland on the car. And that, with the green, mm -hmm. was amazing. Okay. Then the first year went incredibly good. And then obviously for us in Germany, and I mentioned already in my German introduction, you were the 
team of the Germans, almost everybody in that period drove for you. And then obviously there was Michael Schumacher in Spa. What do you remember? How did he get into the team? How was the true story? Well, to the best of my knowledge, because you know it's a long time ago yeah. now. Um, but I remember in all of the junior formulas that I remember Gerd Kramer. Mm -hmm. And I thought Gerd Kramer was an extremely high quality man. He represented Mercedes very well. Um, high quality in terms of uh, his application, his style, his demeanor, everything was cool. And he used to drive me crazy, telling me about this Michael somebody or other. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I, I could not spell his name. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't spell his name. So when people tell me that I'm a great talent scout, it's nonsense. It's mm. not true. Mm. The reason I took Michael Schumacher at number one is because I had seen him in Formula 3. I had seen him with Willy Weber's team and they won the... But I wasn't sure how good the Formula 3 championship in Germany was. Mm. And when I'd seen him in the sports cars with Wendlinger and with Frensen, and he didn't stand out. Mm. But the most important thing is, he had $150,000 worth of money from Mercedes, which came in a strange way, because mm. even though I know it came from Mercedes, mm. they probably might try to deny that, but it came from Sauber. Mm -hmm. so why would Sauber pay me $150,000 to put Schumacher in the car? Of course, it came from Mercedes. But you know, that was fantastic for Mercedes, because here they were, they had a young junior team in sports cars, and they were encouraging and they were making sure that the people they backed, that they liked, that this was going to be their future. Mm -hmm. And so, well done to Gert Kramer. Um, Gert Kramer was the main man. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, was a little bit of Willy Weber, mm -hmm. but some people will say it's Willy. Of course, Willy was there involved. But it was the origi uh, original contact mm -hmm. uh, was Gert Kramer. Yeah. And then the weekend itself. I mean, first you had this test in, in Silverstone. Well, the test, funny enough, in Silverstone, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm thinking, who is this guy? Mm. Uh, will he be okay? Um, Gasho Bertram, uh, good driver. He had just finished fourth or fifth in Canada, so the team obviously was able to work. When I think back, when I see people now finishing fourth and fifth, um, I think, oh my God, that's an amazing achievement. But what I have to think back in my first year, Jordan finished fourth and fifth in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, with, with the Cesaris and then with Gasho. Gasho had the problem with the police, uh, went in front of the court, he was sent to jail, I needed a driver. I didn't believe that they would keep him in jail, I genuinely, so that's mm -hmm. why I didn't actually go out of my way to try and find another driver. And if I didn't need another driver, I always knew an ex-teammate of mine that I used to drive with was a good friend, Stefan Johansson, mm -hmm. he would have driven the car. So. Um, we roll on to the situation and um, obviously Gasho has gone to jail and, and I needed a driver. We do the test. Um, I'm sitting in my office and at that time there was mobile phones but not very good and Trevor Foster, who was my team manager, rang me and he said, look, can you please urgently speak to Silverstone and, and check is the circuit what we're driving on, which is the back circuit, the test circuit, mm. is it exactly the same as it normally is? Mm. Said, Trevor, what are you telling me? I don't want to know. Mm. How's the test going? He said, look, ring Silverstone. Mm. So I rang what they call Silverstone Sid. He mm. was the guy in charge. And I said, look, Sid, just a strange question, but are all the cones and all the marks in exactly the same position? He said, 100%. He said, why? He said, I said to him, mm. because this guy seems to be, he said, Eddie, I'm there, mm. I'm watching. This guy is incredible, mm. <laughs> incredible. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, that's Trevor told me he's incredible. So Sid told me, and Sid would know, he knows every driver in the world. So I'm saying, I better go over and have a look. So I went and had a look and I saw the sheet and I saw the times. And the last time I'd seen something like that, where there was a driver that we were involved in that had made such a difference was in 1982 when we gave Ayrton Senna his mm -hmm. first ever drive in Formula 3. And uh, I was there also for that and I couldn't believe how quick he was going. The same feeling was for Michael. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how quick he was because this was something so completely different. Yeah. Um, 
No, because it wasn't a gradual thing. You know, some drivers take a little bit of time mm. to progress, to settle in, to see what's like. Here was a driver who'd come from Formula 3, a bit of sports cars, and suddenly he's driving a Formula 1 car, preparing for his first ever Grand Prix, because he paid the money, bang, bang, bang. And I couldn't believe how quick he was. Mm. I couldn't believe how quick he was. Mm. Then we all know what happened in the weekend. Everybody saw this is a, is a, a future star. Did you believe to lose him within 14 days to Benetton? Did you ever consider that? Well, there was a couple of things. Mm. I, I, you know, I was very young to Formula One. And I thought, I thought I was aware of things. I never really believed I was that mega clever in terms of being smart because there was some, you know, we just... Uh, Ferrari, Enzo had gone, and, but Luca was there and he was that clever. Ron Dennis was there, yeah. McLaren, he was very clever. Frank Williams, they were all clever people. So I, I didn't think I was m more clever than them, but at the same time, I thought I understood yeah. corporate law. I understood finance for sure, because that was my training. Um, and I have to say, I was still, to this moment, I'm very disappointed. I'm disappointed in Willie. Mm -hmm. um, I'm dis disappointed in IMG, mm -hmm. who were Michael's potential sponsor. Um, Michael, I'd like to think, had, he came to me a couple of times afterwards and said, look how disappointed and how, uh, how he had nothing to do with this and various things. But, you know, it teaches you. Mm -hmm. It's a great lesson. But when you sign a contract, whether it's with a television company or I'm signing with something or else, It's very important to read. It's the, the, what do they say? The devil is in the detail. Mm -hmm. So it was the detail. There was a word changed. Mm. He signed a contract. I signed a contract. But when I received the contract that he signed, there was a change of the word, which I didn't see mm -hmm. till much later. Yeah. And it said, I undertake to sign a contract. It had been the contract. Okay. Which is their contract is their contract mm -hmm. and a contract is a contract that needs to be negotiated. Yeah. But it had already been negotiated. Mm. So it was underhand in my opinion. Mm. It was not correct. But you know, I'm not bitter. Mm. It was a fantastic opportunity. And as Bernie always said to me, Jordan, you were nearly bankrupt anyway, so the chances are why would I want That's Bernie. Why would I, Bernie, want you to have Michael Schumacher when I needed him in the sport? Because Germany was huge. Mm. You know, Winkelhock was one of the, probably the rest of it. Yep. It was one of the last drivers that you guys had. And Germany was a huge market, huge country, and deserved to have some uh, representation in Formula One. Uh, the representation you had was sports cars, but no one was really listening. Mm. And Germany was such a um, mighty, amazing country that uh, it, it needed to have. For all of those aspects, those arguments, I get. I mm. understand that. Yeah. But I'm thinking about myself, I'm thinking about my staff, I'm thinking about what we did. We took the risk. Yeah. Uh, so the money we received back from it uh, was poor in consideration to what we actually did. Okay. But then I've, I also think Bernie knew that you are going to have Yamaha engines, which you needed because they were for... For nothing, you well, didn't have to pay them. Really, you know, the situation, we, we, we were bankrupt. And, mm. you know, as we speak, and it's yeah. funny, the guy who owns this place was the guy who bailed me out. Mm -hmm. We were at school together, we're all friends. He went into banking. I was in motor racing. We were great friends. He did karting. I did karting. And when I was desperate, mm -hmm. he loaned me the money to pay to Cosworth because we had a winding up petition. The winding up petition is bankruptcy notice mm -hmm. and uh, full marks to, to Michael of course here but Bernie knew that mm -hmm. and he firmly believed that we were in a hugely precarious position uh, because a position that wasn't going to survive or that's what he thought you know most teams that came into Formula One they stay a short time they're gone mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't to know that how tough I am inside. He wasn't to know how resilient I was or how passionate I am about the business and sport. And um, I kept saying to him, Bernie, I can do this. Mm. Stop. Mm. I can do this. <laughs> yeah. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. Take the money. Mm. Take the Yamaha engines. Yeah. So he told Schumacher mm. that I was having Yamaha engines. And I think 
uh, that was oh, yep. that was the end of the line. So Michael had made up. Look, Willie was making his mind up. IMG. I have to say, just in case people might think that it was, it was IMG who changed the contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Willie must have known. Yeah. But so must Michael. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, uh, I am not a bitter person. Mm -hmm. I'm not sad because my life has been amazingly lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, I am the luckiest person to be alive. Um, so from that point of view, it's part of the history. Then you had three, let's say, on the sporting side, tough years, first with Yamaha, then two years with the hard V10 engine. How difficult was it to survive in that period where probably you needed a factory engine, which you got then later with Peugeot and, and, and Honda? Well, there were a couple of things. Yep. Um, I had an amazingly good guy in uh, designing the car and the design team, even though we were very small. Gary Anderson was a, a fellow Irishman, and um, I said, look, Gary, it's very simple. I need to know everything that's going on the car. Mm -hmm. I need to know everything in terms of investment. I need to see the design, but I'm not going to be over-involved. I need to find sponsorship for this business. And uh, I need to be sure that we have the money. So we had a little tiny piece of TV money, which was tiny. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I had found Sassel. Uh, Sassel was a South African company. Uh, I was just so lucky. There was an Irish guy who was a very senior lawyer in the business. And uh, Sassel um, needed a contact between, um, because they made oil out of coal. Mm -hmm. And they needed a contact with Petrobras, which made oil out of uh, sugarcane. And I knew the people between Senna, which was still a very great friend of mine at that stage, because what we had done in the early days mm -hmm. with him, and then it was he who brought me Barrichello. Mm -hmm. And we put that sort of thing together. So uh, we got three years sponsorship with Sassel. And then very soon after Sassel um, became Bartley's, became uh, uh, Bartley's left, and then we got uh, Benson and Hedges. Mm -hmm. So the Benson and Hedges days, were hugely important to me because it gave us stability. Yep. Uh, but there was a very rocky patch. Yep. Um, the Yamaha, being 100% honest, we could not have survived without Yamaha. Yep. But then there was also another excuse, and that is that we could have very easily been destroyed by Yamaha because the performance of the engine was very poor. Mm -hmm. But we scored a championship point. Yep. And we have to remember the championship points were top six then. Mm -hmm. And um, we scored a championship, uh, Stefano Modena, and, uh, and then following on from that, of course, you know, the Japanese races were important to us because Irvine scored points against Senna mm -hmm. uh, all those years ago. People re may remember that because that was the year that Senna punched <laughs> uh, Irvine, we remember. It was in your, in, uh, in, in, in your motorhome there. Yeah, in or, our motorhome. Yeah, but yeah. the person, mm. just for historical occasions, you should know, <laughs> the person behind all of this was Gerhard Berger. Exactly, who he won the money. Yeah. <laughs> he drank too many schnapps yeah. with car lines <laughs> <laughs> and sent Senna down to punch him. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, there yeah. are long, funny stories. But you know, it's part of the what happened. Yeah. And um, so... Yamaha was finished, then Brian Hart mm. was very good for us, mm. and Brian Hart gave us a platform mm -hmm. um, because McLaren uh, wanted to move to Mercedes, and they had a contract with Peugeot. Uh, Ron came to me and offered me the Peugeot deal, but he wanted me to pay for it, and I told him no, mm -hmm. because he wasn't paying for it. So Ron and I, we had a couple of tough times and tough mm -hmm. conversations. Um, and so he wanted you to pay for and you helping him, for helping him out yeah. with his, uh, to, to, well, to well, sort out his problems. Yeah, exactly. You must know Ron Dennis yeah. as well as yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Ron was a great man, yeah. and uh, in <laughs> lots of different ways. Yeah. And when you see what's happening at McLaren now, yeah. compared to when he yeah, yeah, sure. uh, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't even bear consideration. However, um, the reality was, and I bet even you with your great mind, and how you know the history and the stats of Formula One, Jordan won more points for Peugeot than McLaren. Mm -hmm. So it was a, we were a decent team, but we were never a front-running team. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, that's it. Peugeot were very good. 
uh, we love them. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we know about Honda came in after yeah. that. And uh, but let's stay a little bit. You know, we didn't we didn't leave Peugeot. Yep. Peugeot left to go to Prost. Yep. To Liger because uh, Mitterrand, it was a completely and as we all know French connection. how political the French are mm. uh, in every aspect of life, and that hasn't changed. Believe me. Um, <laughs> this will probably be scrubbed out of this yeah. part of the program, but I think it should stay in because it's it's important to know that the yeah. French are hugely nationalist nationalistic for themselves. Yeah. Um, and Prost wanted the Peugeot yeah. engine, so he got it. I wound up with nothing. Yeah. But he did me a favour because I then went to Honda. Sure. And Mugen Honda, who I'd known and won a championship with in Formula Three Thousand. Mm -hmm. Of course, it helped that I knew them so well, and I'd already had maybe ten, twelve drivers of. Jordan uh, racing in Formula 2 in Japan. So there was a, always a good feeling about Japanese people always like Jordan. Yeah. We have to stay one year with, with the, in the Peugeot era. You uh, hired then Ralf Schumacher. Did you hire him because you thought it's another Michael? You know, I, I had a huge feeling for Ralf. Mm. Uh, absolutely, of all the drivers I've had, he's right up there. I had a very strong feeling for him, personally, uh, uh, um, about his mind, um, his ability, uh, his laughter, and just the way he was so different to Michael. Mm. Michael was so serious and so concentrated. Uh, Ralph was a different kind of person. You know, in life, two parents. And they can produce too many different things. Mm. And that's what life is about. Sometimes it's fun. Yep. But Ralph, for me, was overall uh, a much easier. And um, I'm not saying he was a better person than Michael. Mm. But don't, you have to remember, I didn't know Michael very long. Yeah, you sure. know, he just mm. arrived yeah. and something happened that I didn't like. Mm. And I thought something happened that maybe he didn't like. Mm. But I've never really found out from him mm. what he really thought. Okay. He didn't speak mm. about it. Yeah. But Ralph was a different person. Mm. He was a committed team player. He was committed to Jordan. I'd taken him from Japan in Formula 2. Mm. And he realized that getting to Jordan um, was his best chance to go right mm. to the top in Formula 1. In the first year, he had to sort out some troubles between him and Fisichella. There were two long lions in a small cage. How was that? How difficult was that to control well, them? It's, it's um, you know, there was a number of issues. You know, Fisichella um, was a young gun. Um, you know, in Argentina, the two of them, um, there was all sorts of battles where we should have won and they hit each other and mm. stuff like that. And you're always going to get that. The, at that time, you know, there was Prost here and then they were all in either Williams or they were and Berger and stuff, they were in, in McLaren. And, and for me, I was really seen to be preparing drivers mm -hmm. for bigger teams. Mm -hmm. So I could see that Fisichella was very good, maybe not as, quite as intelligent as Ralph was, uh, but had great natural talent. I mean, I'm sure you're... you're people will understand that the mo biggest criteria of anybody is speed. Mm. And once they've got speed, then you have to think about adding on other aspects. And those aspects are how they handle the sponsors, how they understand the car, when to make sure that they turn the brake balance up or back or stuff like that. Mm. What you're now seeing with Sy Lewis Hamilton is a complete driver. Mm. And I think it takes a long time. And people like... Michael, of course, but you know, I look at Prost because I actually raced with Prost in Formula 3 myself in the mid 70s, and I can see a lot of what he did for himself. He had a very, very balanced and very cool head, and as a result, he won championships. He should have won more, in my opinion. Yeah. But um, if you ask Bernie, he will say who was the best driver that he remembers, he would always say Prost. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he said Prost was because Prost never shied away from any competition. He never shied away from any teammate. He just got on with it. He mm. didn't become too political, mm. which is unusual for a French person. But if you look at Michael, Michael always wanted to know who his teammate was. He always had in the contract that that teammate couldn't pass him or he was allowed to pass. 
And if I was to think back about great, 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 great drivers, of sure, Senna's in there, Fangio's in there, Michael's in there, and I think you probably very soon have to include Lewis Hamilton mm -hmm. in there. But the one thing that I would say about Michael that uh, detracts from him, he was never awesome in qualifying. Mm. He was never that great in qualifying, mm. great racing driver. And he always had a manipulation as to how his contract would be. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think he was an awesome driver. You know, seven world champions, no one has ever achieved that. So from that case, Michael, of course, has mm. a huge following and he's revered in every, every part of the world for what he achieved. Yeah. Uh, Fisichella was followed by Damon Hill, who was a rival of Michael Schumacher. The first time you took not a young guy on board, you took a world champion on board. I didn't want, I didn't want Damon. Why not? I didn't think he was quick enough. Mm. Uh, I was Irish, mm. he was British. <laughs> um, I didn't like it. Mm. Um, I was pushed into it. By uh, the sponsor, I guess. Benson yeah, Rogers. Yeah. Uh, they paid him. At the time, which was a lot of money, uh, they paid him his salary. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't have got what we got if it wasn't Damon Hill. Mm. So please bear that in mind. Um, he had been a world champion at Williams, which I thought he was very lucky to win it. Mm -hmm. He then went to Arrows. Uh, he didn't win there. However, he did have one very good race in Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that it was going to bring a lot of awareness marketing opportunities so i said you know i'll do it so i had ralph who was the one that i really really believed in yeah and i i, I loved him mm -hmm. i loved him for his his mind uh, for his talent and for his personality mm -hmm. he was a great guy he is a great guy and um so yes i i did it and sometimes in life you've got to do things that aren't exactly as you want them to be but you have to think about other aspects of life that lead into that and from that point of view uh, Damon um, actually was very good and the reason I say that was he was not the quickest mm -hmm. but he had unbelievable experience that we never saw because we only ever had the Fisichellas, the Irvines and the, the you know, Kellogg, yeah. Schumann, yep. all of those yep. young kids mm -hmm. um, and as a result, to find a really experienced guy sitting down with the engineers, the engineers are all completely enthralled because they wanted to know what went on at Williams. They wanted to know what went on here. And I think we probably got a better car because we had Damon. Mm -hmm. But Damon was never, in my opinion, he was never really uh, uh, that quick. Okay. When I say that quick, I have to be careful because it's not fair. Of course, he's a world champion, so he must be very, very mm. quick. But was he as quick as Senna? In my opinion, no. Mm. Was he as quick as Michael? Absolutely not. Mm. Was he as quick as Prost? No. But he's at the next level. Okay. Then he won the race, your first Grand Prix win. Tell us about this race. And I think afterwards there was another story to follow. Because well, there's lots of yeah. different stories. Um, uh, we went there and we had... We were beginning to have a, a difficult season, and um, but we had made some changes and we had some uh, a new sponsor and I had found some money, um, which I had allowed the engineers to develop a car, and um, the turning point was the British Grand Prix mm -hmm. uh, in July, uh, and uh, at that stage you'd have the first half of the season, the back half of the season, and there would be a balanced TV money and stuff, and Ralph finished sixth. From the back of the pool. Mm -hmm. He drove an amazing race. Damon spun off in wet dry and um, everything that I believed in Ralph was coming through. I thought he was an amazing talent um, and then we went to the next race and we, we, we did really well there and we went to I think Germany we mm -hmm. maybe finished fourth or fifth. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we're now in Spa uh, beginning of September um, don't ask me why, the previous year we had been second with Fisichella, so our car always was suited to Spa. Mm. And it's ironic, I won the Formula 3 Championship with Johnny Herbert mm -hmm. in Spa. Mm -hmm. I won the Formula 3000 Championship with John Alessi mm. in Spa. 
have no idea. Mm. You can't even test it. It's a road <laughs> circuit. There is no given reason as to yeah. why Jordan should be quick at Spa. Yeah. I have no idea. Because different designers, different people, different this, that, and the other. It's an amazing story. So we are quick there. Uh, Hill qualifies third. Ralph, I think, seventh or eighth. Um, a good day, possibly coming. And we'll see what happens. Um, and, of course, the rain. Uh, Damon makes a terrible start. Um, and the rain stops and then that massive crash with David Coulthard. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if your, your people realise that I've worked for the last 13 years on television with David Coulthard. Mm. And he's an amazing guy. He always says, I won your first race for you. Because, yeah. <laughs> because of what happened to Michael mm. Schumacher. But, you know, the reality was we were there. We were able to pick up the pieces. Were we lucky? 100%. Mm. Uh, Michael should have won the race, but he didn't. Mm. And that's life, isn't yeah. it? You have to get around, you have to finish yeah. before you. So he hit, he hit cooled hard. It allowed Damon Hill. To be fair to Damon, he led off start on the restart, and he led for most of the race. Michael passed him, so mm. he was going to finish on the podium, so it was going to be a decent weekend for us. Um, but to win it was very unusual, and to finish first and second was completely crazy. In fact, I think it's still history and that a, young, a new team uh, to win a race uh, no other team has won a race as, as a, uh, for the first time and also to finish second yeah it's very unusual but ralph should have won the race he was faster uh, than in the uh, end uh, ralph mm -hmm. was so quick at the end mm -hmm. but you know it was a difficult situation because ralph had never led mm -hmm. and um damon had been leading the race all the time um damon Tires were going off, and he was being ultra careful because that's what we were telling him to do. It was still wet, mm. uh, and we know Spa is notorious, and uh, it's slippy, fast, uh, and uh, mm. you need to be on top of your game. So Damon was on top of his game, but he could see that Ralph was catching him like three, four seconds a lap over, but it's a big, mm. long lap. Um, and he came on the phone to me, and he said, look, Eddie, you can have a war or not. Mm. It's simple. You can have a win. And you possibly can finish second, or you can have chaos. Now, we had just had chaos in Argentina mm. the races before, yeah. or the previous yeah. year, mm. um, where the two drivers took each other out. Yes, we still p finished on the podium, but that race, the villain of one in Argentina should have been Jordan mm -hmm. one and two. It mm -hmm. didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so now, please think about it. We are, we are now in the middle of Spa. I had to make a decision. So the easiest and the best decision for me is, I don't care who wins this race. Mm. I'm thinking about Jordan, I'm thinking about the staff, I'm thinking about the sponsors. Yep. I'm thinking about the, the suppliers and, and the people and everyone who are Jordan mm. fans. They don't care mm. whether it's Ralph Schuer. In fact, in many respects, most of them would have wanted Damon Hill to win mm. because, mm. you know, the folklore, the yeah. history, the, uh, it's romantic. It's yeah, it was going to be his last win anyway. Yeah. He's yeah. won again. Yeah. Um, and, um, of course... Uh, there were repercussions. Mm. Uh, Ralph, in my opinion, he took it like a man. Because mm -hmm. uh, I had to come on the radio and say, Ralph, you cannot. I told Sam Michaels, who was his engineer, you cannot pass. Mm. And he, he refused to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But when he did acknowledge, uh, he was clearly upset, which is natural. Yeah, sure. mm. You'd be upset if he wasn't upset. Mm. Uh, but he understood it. Mm -hmm. And on the podium, he was a little bit subdued. But then he realized, hey, man, I'm on a podium. I finished second in mm -hmm. Spa. Yes, my team at, but I know that I'm quicker than him, mm -hmm. or was quicker than him. However, that's what happened. And then there was some festivities and some jubilation. Everybody was joyous in the team. It was Jordan's first win. We'd also finished second. You know, it was like a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Michael, who was clearly still upset about what had happened to Coulthard, um, because I think Michael behaved quite badly, to be truthful. Um, you can't go into somebody's garage uh, with your helmet on wanting to punch somebody. Mm. Uh, in sport, you have to keep your hands to yourself. You're not, that's not possible. Everybody is in sport for various reasons. And, you know, if you want to go into boxing, then you go to boxing. <laughs> but you can't go into somebody's garage want to beat somebody or, or punch him. Um, and Michael did that. So he was clearly upset, mm. very upset. And then the easiest option was to be upset with me um, because maybe of the past history, because he'd paid. He's never liked, Michael has never liked the idea that he paid for his first draft. Mm -hmm. 
and he did. Yeah. But why people get upset about that, I don't know. Yeah. The fact is, he became a seven times world yeah. champion. <laughs> and it was Jordan who gave him that chance. Yeah. So why mm. shouldn't he have paid? He yeah. did pay. Yeah. So he interfered now in, now this, he's in the other matter. Yeah. Mm. And he said to Ralph, he said to me, you, you, you will, uh, Ralph will never drive for you next year. Mm. And I said, well, Michael, you know, in life, it's very clear. Mm. It's a contract. Mm. And in the contract, there's a buyout clause. And in the buyout clause, it's two and a half million. Mm. If you want to buy his buyout clause, just give me the money. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. He did. Mm. And Ralph went to Williams. Mm. We took the guy who got sacked out of Williams. Frenson. And what an unbelievable job yeah. Frenson did for Jordan. And then this was the year where you almost won the championship. When did you realize that you really had a chance? Because most of the people outside, they didn't have Frenson on the radar. And all of a sudden, I think most of the people realized after Monza, hang on, there's a chance for Frenson and Jordan. Monza was a great race for him. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just a little clip about Monza. Yeah. You know, people like Ron Dennis, people like other big, my friends, they used to tease me and say, Jordan, you only won races when it was wet, when you got lucky, mm. whatever it is. They could never say that. And he came to me after Monza, and he said to me, because his driver, Hakkinen, um, didn't finish. Uh, I think it was Hakkinen, wasn't yeah, it? Hakkinen, yeah, Hakkinen, yeah. Hakkinen didn't finish, he had the problem, but Frenson was there all the time mm. chasing him. And he said to me, that's the first race you've won uh, on merit. Mm. And I said... Um, I can't repeat on television what I said to him, but it wasn't very nice. <laughs> and I told him what I thought of him. And forget about it. You've just been bitter. Yeah. Um, but we'd won the race. Frenson was an amazing talent, in my mm. opinion. Yeah. However, um, the radar that you said, after Mon, he went on. The biggest problem for us was how we didn't win in Nürburgring. Mm. He was in pole position. He was, was on leading. Pole position. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Here was Jordan on pole position, yeah. fighting for a championship uh, in 1999. Yeah. And he was leading by 20-something seconds, last pit stop, leaves the pit, and something goes wrong. Mm. Um, so for me, it was a formality. It was a definite win. Had he won that race, it would have been Irvine... Uh, Hacken, and Hacken, yeah. Um, was it Räikkönen or Hacken? Hacken. Hacken. Mm. Um, going into Suzuka for the last race. Mm. Uh, virtually the same point. Mm. Uh, but by losing that race, uh, or he and or the car failing um, resulted in a no point. Mm. Uh, it was very sad. But you know, some people have come to me as a result of that. And a, a very clever marketeer, who was the head of Suchart, and... Uh, ultimately became the head of BAT, which was Lucky Strike. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're lucky. I said, why is that? He said, you're lucky that happened. Because had Jordan won that championship, they would have had to be put on a different level. Mm -hmm. And it's a level that they wouldn't have been comfortable with or happy with or whatever it is. You may have won a world. But the best thing for you to be is a team that is able to win odd Mm -hmm. if a small amount of races yeah. and not because the pressure and the PR and the thing in other words your legacy is by being able to beat big teams every now and again yeah. but not be a big team yeah. so what he was saying was Jordan should never have been a big team mm. it never was a big team and I agree with him now but it was a very big bitter pill to suffer yeah. at that time mm -hmm. because I thought that we had a chance not just for the team to win a world championship, but the, the, we couldn't have won the constructors, yeah. but to, to, to give Frenzen, who had been sacked mm. by Williams, yeah. can you imagine, to win the championship? Mm. It would have been a dream come true. Of course. But, you know, he finished on the podium, we finished on yeah. the podium. Yeah, it's not too bad. But after that great year, everybody thought the next step is Jordan will step up again, but it didn't happen. No. It went the other way. What, what went wrong? Oh, well, of course, there's a couple of reasons, and it's easy to be clever after mm, the event. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, the battle which I'd had for 12, 14, 15 years uh, from the fiscal, the financial situation um, had taken its toll. Um, I think 
that whilst we had a lot of success uh, with German sponsors, with the Deutsche Post, uh, with Postbank, and of course some of the great stories about DHL, which are you know the yellow, the yellow army, and all of the people, but the German drivers, the German sponsors, mm. and the Irish team. It, it was a magic story. Mm. Um, but um, Benson and Hedges, which we needed, uh, the tobacco industry was outlawed, as yep. we know. Um, tobacco was becoming a very difficult position. Um, and it, it was um, something that I understood um, very clearly. Um, smoking inside places or the position of smoking and I'm not becoming political but I can understand it mm. I didn't like it yep. but I understood it so um, the situation was that I felt um, acquiring major sponsors outside uh, in a normal uh, event they weren't going to naturally come to Jordan and we can see that now um, except I was one of the first ones to see it you know McLaren, mm. they didn't see it, yep. and they didn't believe it, yep. uh, and the same applies to Williams, yep. great teams, mm. but without major, major manufacturer's investment, you've got nothing, mm. and I feared, uh, and I got, as we always said, I'm very lucky, as I've explained to you mm. in this pre part program already, um, I have a very good vision, and the vision is that I got out what the going was good. Mm. Before we come to the end, you had one more highlight, highlight, a thing which probably cannot happen again anymore. You won a race in Brazil where you finished second on the paper, but you were first. When did you realize that you actually had won? Um, well, for the people at home, for mm. their view, it was the most bizarre situation because there were two aspects, or maybe three. One, the car could never have moved another five meters yeah. <laughs> because it was on fire. Yeah. We were in the pits. The red flag came out. But we were, you know, if we think back how we won in France, the French Grand Prix, mm. we won it because um, I had somebody in the field telling me where the, the rain was coming. Um, and that person told um, our, our chief mechanic at the time, was Andy Stevenson, he mm. came to us and on the pit lane and said to Gary and I, look, John said da 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 um, that the rain is very heavy and it's going to last for long. So we acted on that information and we won the race. Mm. Same thing happened. By putting a lot of fuel in and you could go we longer. We put a lot yeah, of fuel yeah. so we were able to yeah. struggle to the end mm. on the tires and we nearly got caught. Mm. You know, it was a fantastic race. Um, we were very lucky in Brazil. Uh, and Fisichella, um, the situation with him is he drove really, really well in a hugely difficult situation. Um, but I, you know, the great thing about motor racing, it's life, uh, life experience. And I had been a driver, then I had Formula 3, 3000. So I, I'd been around racing for a very long time. Gary Anderson had been around. Most of the people in my team were hardcore uh, DNA in their blood about racing. So from their point of view, I said to Gary, there's no way this race, it's getting dark. You know, they mm. won the race's latest spot. There's no way they can get, they will get as far as 75%, which means they can, don't have to give half points. Mm. 75% qualifies for a full point yeah. position. They will get to 75 and they red flag it. They have to. The rain is too difficult. Mm. It's not going to happen. What happens 75? So, Coulthard should have won that race. Mm. But Ron Dennis, the guru, the clever one, yeah. he brought him in for fuel on lap 73. Mm. What a stupid man. Mm. But anyway, that's life. Mm. Um, they went back out. They thought they'd won the race. Mm. And then someone else thought they'd won the race. Mm. And the reality was that I believed we'd won the race because of the countback mm -hmm. of when we went over the line. Because Formula One is very clear in the rules and yeah. regulations. The red flag comes out. And it's not that flag, it's the lap before. Yeah. So you wipe on. The problem we had, and when they were giving out the trophies, and um, I had to appeal it, and at that stage I'm not sure you're aware, but it was a well-known secret that um, no one ever won an appeal against the FIA. Well, I didn't care. Mm. I, wasn't, I wasn't embarrassed about the FIA. I wasn't uh, under a spell of the FIA. I was taking this case to the FIA in Paris, and I appealed it. 
because we were given second place. Whereas I knew on the figures and the stats that we had that we had actually gone over the line first on that lap. Yeah. Um, but what had happened? Charlie had realized, and Charlie Whiting, who was yeah. the race director, mm -hmm. had told the timing people, hey guys, you do realize you've got to go back a lap. Mm. Now, they had already factored into the fact yeah. that they had to go back a lap. Mm. But they said, well, what are you saying that for? So they went back two laps, mm. where it was only one. So when mm. we went to Paris, it was quite clear um, what it is. So, hey, the, which the next race was Imola, and I remember the grin on everyone's face because we all had to line up, and Ron Dennis had to give us the trophy in front of everyone, which is nice. But in terms of Fisichella, mm. He didn't get the national anthem of Italy played. Yeah. So he was he was robbed of that opportunity, and the FIA should have been aware. Mm -hmm. So with me in podiums, has never been that successful mm -hmm. because one of the things that I think nobody else knows, and I'd like to tell you, but in '98 when Damon Hill won the championship, when he won the race, and Ralph was second. They played the British national anthem, mm -hmm. and the only reason they played the British one is because they didn't have an Irish one. <laughs> really? They didn't believe we could ever win yeah. the Grand Prix. <laughs> so the reality yeah. is, the next one after that, Damon was British. We had we were living in England at the time with the race team, and um, so the story ended. Our first race, if you want a little bit of uh, for a quiz program. Mm -hmm. um, the national anthem was British. Okay. Then finally, when you had to sell your team in 2005, was it a heartbreaking moment? It was inevitable. Mm. Um, you know, I came from the era at the time, a bit like you, I suppose. Uh, I'm a Bernie babe. Mm. Um, I came into the business when he was there and I exited when he was there. And there were some things that he was very good at, and there were some things that I didn't think he was very good at. But one of the things that I thought he was amazing was vision. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying to me, he said, Jordan, I love you, believe it or not. Because they're not things he says very often. Mm -hmm. He said, I love your family. I don't want to see you hurt. You have a great passion for this sport. You've been a great ambassador. Now, get out of here because it's not going to be a nice place for you mm. in the short term. Mm -hmm. And you, no, I don't want to see you having to survive again. And I went home and I thought about it and I thought about it and I spent all night, that night and the next night. And then two days later I came back to him and I said, do you have somebody in mind? He said, come to see me tomorrow at two o'clock and we go to the little office. At two o'clock the next day he had a guy there And he offered me a stupid price for the mm. thing. Um, but I thought we could do something. And we tried to do something, but you know, it was the right thing. Mm. And I sold the team. Mm. Uh, and it went to Midland and Schneider. And then it became Collis or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. But you know, I think the dream or the Jordan style of things or the people that are still there who were Jordan, I think... Force India now has a chance to do exactly yeah. what we did. And I believe uh, with Lawrence Stroll, mm -hmm. uh, I think with financial stability, mm. yeah. because with, fi with, with belief and with financial stability, you can achieve anything, mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. And I think there is a desire, there's a passion, there's a talent mm -hmm. in that. Team. Okay, that was a wonderful summary. Thank you very much, Eddie great insight of this period in motor racing where you had been an integral part you have to say you played your role this was an outstanding team and thank you very much and i hope michael i'm excited yeah your people may not know this but i've known you mm. <laughs> for a ridiculous number of years and when i need to know something in formula one that i don't know i always come to you so make sure that the people who are doing this interview they realize You are God. Ah, in terms okay. Of <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eddie. Bye bye.